today's session, we've, we've done from the forensic side a few of the sessions now, including sort of the financial statements, how to build up financial statements, manipulate financial statements, the, uh, the business analysis session, the how to do business valuation. This one's flowing on from the all of those, particularly the business valuation session. So you get the business valuation coming in, you're instructing valuers to do the valuation. This session is really starts off a little bit looking at the instructions you're doing, but also when you're looking at the valuation or looking at someone else's valuation, what sort of things should you zero in at? A lot of it's going to be the vibe. It's going to be the old Marbo thing. What does it feel like or castle? Um, it's going to it's going to be um, looking at just seeing what sort of depth in there, what methodology they adopted, why have they adopted that kind of methodology, um, the risks that are associated with there, the opportunity. Um, how have they actually gone and set those things out? Now, just because they're not spelled out one, two, three, four, five, doesn't mean they're not there. But you should get a sort of feeling as to what the value would have done. And quite often, it just it spells itself out to what we're seeing and speaking them. You know the people that do good valuations, and you really sort of identify the ones that someone actually gives you a call from a certain place, and you know it's going to be a little bit questionable. So Peter and I have picked 10 um, uh, things to go wrong. There's more. There's sort of more the sort of the, the um, more common ones. So the first one is incorrect instruction. I'll just pan through these. Um, from our point of view, um, to do the best we can, we need to understand what the purpose of valuation is. Now, it's matrimonial. It's fairly obvious what the purpose is. But there may be sort of underlying things that are in there as well, which may only come out during the, the actual valuation. Do the instructions meet the purpose? So from your point of view, you're instructing someone to do a valuation. Why are they doing a valuation? John, is it all right if we interrupt you? Please. Yeah. And, and, you're, and Andrew, you're, you're probably good from that point of view because you're not family, so you don't have from a commercial viewpoint. Yeah, exactly. So understanding the purpose, why do we need to give you a purpose? Why does it, what, what's the difference in a valuation for a family or that? Give you, I'll give you the next slide, yeah, um, and that's really, it's a good question, and it's probably more from a commercial viewpoint. Yeah. Why is it being done? But also from a family law viewpoint, which we'll harp on a little bit later, um, stepping on your toes a little bit, the difference between property and a financial resource. So what is value? Now, you, you would have seen this slide previously. There's a whole lot of different valuation um, types out there, or value types out there. Now, from a family law point of view, Normally, we're going to um, market value or fair market value, which is your standard definition. But from a commercial viewpoint, and, and commercial, let's put it to the fault as well. Yeah. So for ninety percent of them, they're probably just the, that same. But then you start getting into true value, um, which will be that um, parent or white Nestor land case. But actually, define true value with a property being valued up in the arena. Um, in North Queensland, they said the valuer came in and said, here's the value and can take into account something else that was actually happening in the marketplace, which subsequently dramatically changed the value of it. So the court came up with this new <coughs> true value. Um, that true value, as it turns out, is the same thing, but they define it slightly differently. Um, so, so the market value, everyone knows that. We've got that so here, here. Here. Um, We've got going concern value and liquidation value. Um, is it a going concern? Is it viable? If not, is it a liquidation or option by sale type approach? It will be a very different outcome depending on how you're doing it. Um, and then we get down to, which, sorry, I'll, I'll go one more for the commercial side, fair value, doing something like compression action. Um, it may be a slightly different approach. Is it, is it fair? Is there other things, other factors we need to take into account? If we're doing um, for family, there's no value for this business. It's purely run on a personal contacts of the husband or wife, and as a result of those personal contacts, they're making a significant annual additional profit. But you couldn't sell it because the, the, the arbitrage would go. In that case there, we value what that would be to the husband or the wife. Now, special purpose value for some form of um, takeover. Um, Sorry, just on that, I mean, the court has said, assume there is a market and do it on market value. So it, it sort of goes back to market value anyway, but I've done a few reports places where I've said, I don't consider this business could be sold, but taking into account the concept of value to owner and then going back to market value to the current owner does have a value. We quite often come up with ones where you 
may be able to sell it. It may have some sort of construction company. It has a certain um, number of contracts on foot, and you could value it having those construction contracts, profit on those construction contracts. You could say yeah. that that's part of the, the premium if you, if you want to buy that entity. Of course, the husband's there, or the wife's there, they've got all these contracts. You know you're going to get all these things in the future. But a value with the husband there is worth a lot more than what it would be if you had to try to sell it. And again, that may start coming up with a different type of value. Um, special purpose value, again, is doing something to take over what the additional amount someone would pay and why would they pay it, what are the synergies that would be in there. So there's probably the, there are specific reasons, probably the last 10% of the ones we talked about, that a, the purpose may make a different uh, approach. Here's the definitions which we've seen before, pricing and the negotiated open numbers through the market between knowledgeable, willing, but not anxious buyer and seller. You don't have one of those, technically you don't have market value. Um, and it's probably more, not necessarily building up a value, but actually saying is, is a comparable um, sale market value. So XYZ business sold for this, therefore we should sell for that, that's market value. Or maybe it wasn't because of what it may not be an arm's length, or maybe an anxious buyer or seller. You probably see that more in profit. And this one is the second definition which is probably more appropriate than what we're looking at and it's sort of defined more of our methodology. The amount of prudent investors prepared to pay in order to receive the future earnings um, given, given the risk. So it's future, so looking forward, not back. What are the future cash flows or profitability associated with this investment and what's the risk that's there? And those last two really are what we're trying to identify in most evaluations we're doing. So we're valuing the business, the entity or the interest. You still quite often get asked to can you value the business where what you're chasing is actually the party's interest in the in the actual company itself. <coughs> That's probably the most common, if you like, incorrect instruction. We often get told this value is the business of Phil's Plumbing, but Phil's Plumbing is actually operated by Phil's Plumbing Private Limited, of which they only own 50% of the shares. So what you've really got to do is value their shareholding. And maybe there's a loan account in there as well too. So when you're really working out Phil's interest, which is half the shareholding, but you've got to value the business first to work out what the shares are worth, to work out what his half share is worth. Okay. And it's probably something we see um, <coughs> reasonably often when we see business um, brokers. Value businesses, they give you value in the business. They don't give you a better value to value business without the debt, which may be 100% correct, but they've only done one of the steps and they haven't taken into account the Later party line. So we're valuing 100% or the percentage interest. Someone's got a 20% interest in the entity. You take the value of 100%, I'm taking 100% multiplied by 20%, or are we actually looking at 20% as a different approach to valuing it altogether? Um, looking back <coughs> forward, again, that's that valuation uh, definition. It's the, it's all about the future profit that's going to be there. Um, and this is where it's really important. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. But what we're trying to do is to take into account all things that we could know about the future. So what are the trends doing? The past is a really good proxy for what the future is going to, going to be. Um, what are the key drivers behind this business? And as a result of those key drivers, is there anything that's changed and that's actually changed the the uh, approach. So a key driver might be we've got a key supplier and we're going to lose the distributorship or the sole distributorship of that business. One of that recently was um, an earth moving equipment. And they, have, they don't have an exclusive dealership, they've got a sole distributorship. And through that sole distributorship, they're doing it's really it's a popular piece of earth moving equipment. They're selling um, about 40% of the market for these earth moving at that size. Um, with one of the products, and that's their main product, with one of the products, um, some other dealers were granted a license and their profit or their sales and level dropped by 10% the loss position for that one. Now they're threatening, they've done it in South Wales, Victoria, they've threatened to do another distributorship up in Queensland. If that happened, through competition, the price would fall. $6 million profit they're making at the moment is likely to be nothing overnight. Um, but from that point of view, the supplier in that case, is the most, one of the most important key drivers. But it might be the employees, it could be key customers, it could be concentration of customers. Um, what are the key drivers? And, and the, what are the chances of them changing in the future? How far do you drill down and analyse those key drivers? So, for instance, in the example of a relationship, which is, uh, sorry, going back, is a, a, uh, the, the profit business is based on the relationship with the supplier being a small distributor. Do you actually look at the agreement and go, What's the likelihood of this? Like, what's the 
term, for instance, left on the sole distributorship, uh, their rights are renewal that could extend for 20 years, or is it going to end at the end of December? If, if, it's a, if it's a key drive, yes, we look at it. Now, we're not throwing ourselves out as lawyers, but at the same time, we do go through it and have a look. Um, we also look at what else has happened out there. How long has it been running for? Um, you know, quite often, you'll see an operating agreement for one year, and it'll be thrown out to us that, you know, they can take months. <coughs> and yes, they can, and under the agreement, they can. But they're running under that for renewing that annual operating agreement for the last 20 years. Um, and there's no changes that actually happened out there. So what are the chances? It's a, it's a risk, but they're saying it's, it's, you can't value it because of that. Well, I don't agree with that. Um, so we take it into account, definitely, and, and it's really important you do, but you've got to sort of weigh up the probability of something happening. Mm. And it's people it's, buy business yeah. with those sort of agreements because they're more common. They're, they're only agreements, they're not. Yeah. They're slightly different to a franchise where you haven't got a lot to
2010, you adopted on historical results. How well would you value this thing? So a three times multiple in there, seven and a half minutes, two years' time, you're making a lot. This really highlights you've got to look forward. Whatever means you've got, you need to look forward. So I saw a um, evaluation, not dissimilar, but it wasn't a business itself, it wasn't how it didn't have, it was a professional services business, so it's based on relationships and price with no guarantee of any good ongoing instruction. There's no, it's not necessarily wrong or right. Yeah. And you've got to look at it at the time and say, <laughs> what is representative going forward? Yeah. An average of the last three may be right. And if you've got an incredibly stable business, it's not really going for down, last three years may be right. But I guess it's incumbent on the instructing solicitor to say, if there's, if there's vast differences for 20 years, to um, instruct you guys about what those that normals are that um, affected the penal that particular it's, it's, it's 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 up to us to try and find that out. So when we do our analysis, so we take all the results and then we'll rip those apart and say why. And that's the importance of a site visit or it might be. And you hear of things like desktop audits or desktop valuations. That's where we take the financials. We just try to do evaluation from what's there. You may get a good guide, and, and we do a lot that way. We actually get a good guide, and normally the business is not fluctuating a great deal. But if there are fluctuations, so the actual sales go up or down, or the margins go up or down, the expenses go up or down, you need to investigate why. Or it may be that the actual asset base they're relying upon fluctuates. Debtors may go through the roof one year, um, and that will affect the valuation as well. So I think a lot of the stuff we've already sort of touched on, but so you've got to understand what the business is doing internally and then also externally. So what's the business story? You've got to understand it. Talk to the owners, ideally. Sometimes you get instructions that you're not allowed to talk to people. New South Wales family lawyers don't like it. talking to anyone. Okay, they've got to be in writing and they've got to be I find Brisbane practitioners a bit more friendly. The, um, one of the key business drivers, John's already spoken a fair bit about that. Um, a site visit's often very good. You just, just chatting to the business owner often brings things up that you know, um, wouldn't have otherwise found out just looking at the financial statements. Um, is there a business plan or strategy? That's pretty rare that there is. That the owner might at least have some sort of idea about where, where things are going in the future. Um, the management and the employees, so how dependent is the business on you know, particular key people? That's something that's going to drive the business. Is there one person who's a great salesperson who just drives all this you know, work through the door? Or have you got 10 salespeople who all sort of contribute equally and therefore if one of them left, it's not going to be quite such an effect on the business? Um, what's the financial position and the cash flow? So whilst you're looking at the profitability of the business, you also have to look at the cash flow and, and maybe they're making lots of profits, but if they're not actually collecting all their debtors, they're making a lot of sales, they're not collecting the cash, maybe the business might have a, a going concern problem. Um, and what's their capacity and utilisation? So have they got a room to grow or are they pretty well running at full steam at the moment? So therefore, to get to that next level, you know, it's like in your own terms, you know, if, you, if you want to increase your fees, you've got to hire someone else and then so they might only be 50% available for this year. So you've got this, they're not really making you any money for the first year. And it's only in year two and year three. And the same sort of thing with a lot of other businesses that do they go out and buy this wonderful new piece of equipment which will increase their capacity? But to do so, they've obviously got to take a whole lot of debt. And it might take two or three years for that machinery to really pay for itself. You use this one, it highlights so many things in valuation. I may have talked briefly in the valuation session. We did a uh, bottling factory bottling plant down in um, uh, down the coast. It had installed in its its coast operations and its Melbourne operations a bottling plant in each one. Each plant cost three and a half million dollars and a million and a half to install, mm -hmm. so five million dollars. Brilliant machine. Like to actually watch it, it was just on the nerdy account. I love looking at these things and seeing them from the actual point where it built plastic nubs and went into the, the extruder. Bottle appeared, label went on, got filled, went round, came round, got put onto a deck, um, went down, and then it got wrapped in pallets. So from the point of the plastic nub, through to a pallet of bottled water, no one was there, was no person on the line. It was just fascinating to watch. Um, so $5 million, at that stage, um, the two plants, which uh, back in a valuation around $7 million. So if 
top 10 milking time. So lots of work, 10 or 7. It hadn't reached its capacity. Its capacity was about, I think at that stage it was doing 110 million bottles a year um, and had capacity of about 200 million. That's um, It was a fascinating thing what thing to do. <coughs> if it didn't work, because the moment it was its financial position, it was just making um, enough to actually cover the, the cost. Um, and there's another one where we actually we're going to shortly with the external side. Uh, one of its customers was Costco. Uh, well, we're trying to get customers, Costco as customers. It went to Costco, Costco with a pricing, pricing and came back and said, it's too high. Um, but don't go away, give us your costing and we'll tell you where your problem is. Gave them costing and said, do -do -do -do. you're buying your plastic nibs too much. Go to these guys, I'm up a bit off, you'll be able to reduce your cost in the bottom. Um, and they did, they're not two cents off the bottom, um, and they got the cost back to uh, Great, an extra $100,000 bottle per year. Problem was, the cost cover was selling at retail for less than what the actual um, other customers were buying it from. So it was actually going to cost code, they then had to reduce the pricing to all of the other customers, which was just head of game that happened anyway. Um, so then, it made, it's got its sales up, so it increased its capacity, the utilisation of its capacity, but actually all, all the actual profitability came down. Now, if it went belly up, which at that stage, it looks like it was in your own right? um, and you probably would know all of this, it's probably one of the most um, prominent ones now. Um, but if it didn't work, and it went belly up, that's $5 million worth of equipment, or to be worked. For me, it was a mil and a half to set it up, so wipe that off straight away. Then you actually take out this used equipment now and you take down the auction yard and you've all seen what used equipment looks like when it's actually a production line and they got a little bit off and they've got the compressor there and you know, if they got half a million dollars or a million dollars, they'd be lucky. So what's it worth on a going and ongoing concern basis? So all of those things come into what we look at. Um, yeah, so we just spoke about required capex is capital expenditure that the, uh, the equipment needs. Um, and the finance and the collateral. So all those sort of things all, and the ownership and succession. So, you know, can you sell this thing? Has there, is there a buyer waiting in the wings that their, their successor is, you know, two years out from taking over? Or who currently owns 50% of that buy buy our 50% when we want to retire in two years' time? So then there's all the external drivers. So the value hopefully has, has done some sort of industry analysis as best you can and uh, sort of understand where this business is in its life cycle. Is it a new up and coming business, a software business that's just created a new market, or is it a very mature sort of business and industry it's operating in? Uh, what's the environment and the economy in general? This is all sort of stuff that you know, hopefully you should just know, and you won't necessarily see it specifically spelt out in the valuation, but it's hopefully something the valuer should have taken into account. Spoke before about you know, who are the customers. What are the contracts they've got and what sort of diversity have they got? So they rely on one big customer, or if you've got a hundred equally small customers, same as suppliers. If you lose a supplier, is there an alternative? Security of tenure. So some businesses, the premises doesn't have a lot of concern. You can normally, it's a factory, you can probably find another warehouse somewhere where you can just relocate to at a cost, obviously, there'll be a relocation cost. Professional officers can normally move and find an alternative premises reasonably easily. If you've got something that's quite specific, childcare centre, um, <coughs> service station, something like that, that really needs a particular business, security of tenure really is quite important. Um, I actually did a pharmacy the other day that was unusual in a hospital. So normally pharmacies, you expect it's just a retail space. You could just, you know, relate to the rules, you can normally find out a shop within 100 metres to move it to. But they actually had the contract to supply in the hospital. So they only had two and a half years left on there. They've been there for 20 years, but that was the end of their five plus five plus five plus five agreement. So potentially in two and a half years, they wouldn't have a business anymore. They're not a huge pharmacy. And that's something we're seeing a lot in retail shops at the moment, and for the darn shopping centre. <coughs> it, it used to be, if you're in a shopping centre, you just find new lifts, find new lifts, find new lifts, and now it really is. The business is running at the end of that lease, and the expectations were renewed, but on what basis? Seeing all the renovations being done in all shopping centres at the moment, and there's huge issues that are happening. Um, the profitability of these stores uh, are all plummeting. You look at some of the inventory, 
still got the, actually, I think statistic is slightly less number of customers coming through the door at the moment. So it's 50% larger than what it was. And most of the stores had to do a renovation of their store or be moved, some of them weren't moved, um, to actually stay in the actual centre. So what's going to happen next time they do? So what do you think has happened to their profitability? If they've done a renovation, spent a couple hundred grand on their sit out, um, so they've got a couple hundred grand more worth of debt, and they've got potentially a third or two thirds of their turnover. That's happening across the board. So at the moment we're doing one in um, uh, Chermside, Mount Gravatt, oh, sorry, our Garden City, and in the South. It's all the same thing. So a lot of retail now is really only the expectation, you know, your business value are based on what the, what's left in the lease. Expected to make those sort of profits for the rest of the lease, and then it's all bets off because they'll either have to do a complete renovation or get moved or something else will happen. So that um, the lease the premises is quite important there. Um, so externally, uh, other alternative products out there, this is a business that's got its own little niche, um, like the pork or ointment people, you know, they, they tell you it's reasonably, it just seems to have flown under the radar for some reason. It's quite a profitable business. Um, and no one seems to have brought an alternative because the market's just not big enough for the big pharmaceuticals to even worry about you know. um, Franchise, uh, food store, Subway. Subway used to be a the end thing. We had a Subway, you lost some good money on the way out and make a lot of good money there. Um, Mexican stores, Mexican stores were great. We valued up the chain of them and they all, you know, we would see them. They started out tremendously and they started actually dying as on every corner we're now starting to go next. I face it twice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this sort of a niche comes in, and, and it's really common. You see someone actually develop a niche, does really well, people see that niche does well, so they come in to see the food. <clears throat> it's a bit like that example John had up before, you know, if they went back in the first year, that's when you're the market leader, and then suddenly all your competitors start to come in, and, and you've probably got two or three years to make some decent money before you start getting all the copycats. You can pie face it. Technology, so we seem to be getting a lot of software things of value. Like every managed dog seems to be inventing some new app or something. So, and that's one where, like I valued one last week, but it's, it's every three years, it's been running three years, they've lost half a million dollars every year. They had an initial two million dollars for the seed capital of investors who were happy to kick in. And they've got some export grants. That's the only thing keeping them alive. They just about run out of their two million dollars. Um, it was a farm management software thing, so they're trying to take it to the states. The sales were only about two or three million dollars a year, so it doesn't take much. All they had to do was probably, you know, they had one minuscule percent of the market in the United States, so it wouldn't have taken much. But they would double their turnover, but it would have been happy days. But just. Will it ever kick up to where it will be under double turnover? That's the big unknown. So, conservatively, I said I don't think it's worth anything. Wife's lawyer rings me and says, You obviously weren't told he was offered $8 million for that about four months ago. I said, Well, no, but I don't know why anyone would offer $8 million. If they are, they're really something a punt, and you can't scientifically if you want to say it's worth $8 million. And that's the trouble out in the market, especially in those sort of things. It's like a shark track, basically. You know, people just rock up. Do the pitch, and someone says, "Yeah, two million. I'll give you two million for it." And really, is a pump because there's no, you know, unless those people on Shark Tank have actually been given all the stuff beforehand. I assume they're given a bit of background. <coughs> they must do some sort of projection forward. They've got to be thinking, well, "Can I make out this going forward?" I went to a lunch with one of the um, Shark Tank guys had a, had a chat, and also twelve that he said yes to he invested in five of them.
how much do you get for when you sell? This desk, I'll take down off this desk box here, the table box here, how much do you get to it back down? Once we take it apart and we knock the corners on the way out. Then you've got to take into account the wind up cost, how much to actually terminate the actual energy itself. Um, if you've got a drum to see if you start, you've got lease termination, potentially a and, and paying out the lease. If you do a three years run your lease, how much you're going to negotiate to actually get out? How much to actually make good? Um, you know, we've had a quote to if we were ripping whether we move or sign a new lease. Um, one of the actual things that actually helped us decide was going to be six hundred thousand dollars to make good our current year. Um, just ridiculous amounts of money. So with that last point, if you were to if you were a, a purchaser buying this asset uh, or the contingent on what it goes out, you know, because it was just an asset sale, then aren't those just the issue of the uh, government purchaser is being to discharge that as well? How does it do it? Depends, depends if, the, if the purchaser's buying the business and signing up the lease, the purchaser's going to actually take on that responsibility. So, as a going concern, yes. So they take over the employees and they take over the, the tenants. But if it was a relocatable type of business that wasn't contingent on taking up those premises yep. or even yep. employees, then the value of the business changes because they just become issues of the purchaser or the vendor, or don't they? Yep. They're going to take care of it. And the vendor will keep the debtors and the creditors, the vendor will keep the liabilities that are sitting there. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, and through the negotiation, some of these things will come in. So, for instance, you talk about employees, so annual lease entitlements, long service lease entitlements. So, that will be a negotiated item. They'll go with the business. Do they actually get paid out by the old by the vendor, or is the actual the um, purchaser take them on and reduce the actual purchase price? So they'll all be part of a negotiated act. Um, the next one's methodology. So now we're getting into sort of the core of how the valuation is done. All of this side of it here is the work that takes into account to actually understand the business. So it's the business analysis side. We've looked at the financials, we've tried to understand the business, done the, um, the site inspection, we've talked to the various people at the place, we've identified what's there. Now we're actually doing the valuation. So it's probably from your point of view, from reviewing a valuation, hopefully you'll see the valuer has considered some of that sort of stuff. Could you please some sort of words in there that, that sort of talk about some of those things? But as you raised the thing about, you know, you saw one that actually has averaged the last three years. Where's that analysis in averaging the last three years? And if you're going to put the capitalization rate, capitalization rate reflects the risk of the business. So we've got two factors we're doing on a think based methodology. We're trying to say what's the earnings doing going forward and what's the risk associated with those earnings going forward. If you haven't done that, you can't do either of those exercises. What you're doing is assuming that the past is the future, which may be appropriate, but depending on the result. Um, and you're, you'll apply a three or four times multiple of 25, 33% capitalization rate, and you're basically saying, well, there's a most often applied, and you may just luck them to it. Getting to the methodology itself, there are a lot of methodologies that are out there, and we went through those the last time. Um, the most common in valuing business is you're going to try to find goodwill to actually apply the capitalization which maintains the earnings, which is a multiple of profit. And it's again where you actually look at your, your ongoing profitability and your risk rate. Um, however, particularly now in the current environment, it doesn't apply in every instance. There are quite a few instances where it's just not appropriate where we need to refer a contract run for two years. You can't apply that approach. You need to actually look at what are the profits over the next two years and then discount that back and say, well, discount a cash flow type approach. Or it might be something you know, Andrew and I are looking at a, um, a financial planner. Financial planners have their own um, industry approach to actually value um, that, that, uh, the business. But again, there's now that, that, that whole approach is starting to be discarded and moving back to a traditional approach. But it hasn't gone yet, so you need to look at it on both bases. But that's, that's interesting because it's the same with the valuation of rent rolls. So there's always a multiple of recurring revenue that I've seen change in certain situations. Right. The, they're probably a little bit more behind the, behind the yeah. game. Yeah. Yes, we looked at one more recently, and the, the reality.
reality was that the rent roll was just that large. That a lot of these uh, these approaches, these industry approaches, come out where someone actually will pick up that small business and tack it on to their own business to actually utilise additional capacity that's not in their, their business. And that's where that approach comes in. So it's really that's usually you know, sucking it into their own business and expanding their own business. But if you're looking at a business that is just that large, that it just completely swamps your business, well, suddenly it's a totally different type of pitch. We did one recently, two recently, went on that the rent rolls are normally done on, it was a two and a half to two and a half to three times what the recurring commission was to do. And, but one in particular was there's three agencies in Canberra who have over a thousand properties on the rent rolls. So who's going to buy that? Yeah. They couldn't find 20 people to each buy 50 properties because if they could cut it up, it was whatever. So that's where you've got to say, we've got to value it as a standard. If no one's going to walk in and pay three times, it's going to work at about $10 million. No one's going to pay $10 million. Who's got $10 million to start with? Who's out there buying rent rolls? Because if they had a 50 property rent roll, yeah, you sell it tomorrow because people will just tack it onto their existing rent roll. So if you're LD, we'll go. I did a Ray White out for Southern Suburbs. He's just been told they're not renewing his franchise. Now, I've never seen that before either. So he's had the Ray White franchise in this suburb for two years, I think. I did the valuation two weeks later. And one of the things I said, when's your franchise agreement? Yeah, he said, oh, it's expiring in three months, but it's okay. I'll get a new one. So going concern. A week later. And, I, and I'll be asking if he's losing, if Ray White's not going to give it to him, he's giving it to someone else. Ray White's giving it to someone else. No, there was really another Ray White two case up the road that way, two case up the road that way. And the market had shrunk. And it was in the particular area of Brisbane. If you couldn't get Chinese salespeople, it didn't do very well. So you can give an idea where it sort of was. So because all the buyers were Chinese and there's just only a limited number of Chinese salespeople. So unless the salespeople could talk Mandarin and Cantonese, they didn't make any sales, basically, because that's just all the people who were moving into the area. So that was, he couldn't get any. The other two guys had managed to get themselves some Chinese speaking salespeople. And Ray White decided that you were better. But he can still sell his rent roll to LJ Hooker or to one of the other Ray Whites. So there's still a future income stream in managing those properties. He could just operate the rent roll by itself and say it won't be Ray White anymore. But he was 62 years old and said, no, I've had enough. I'm getting out anyway. So. Now, maybe the, you've got a business that's trading. And it's trading very profitably, and you would think the automatic approach is the capitalisation earnings. But because of the actual customers, because of the buyers, whatever it might be, it may be we, we just don't see a future in that business. But the risk associated with the actual income stream or the relationship with one of the parties is that strong that someone may only actually buy it for what's their stake. They may only pay, we may still work out that future maintained learning, but they may only pay. Six to twelve months worth of maintained learning, or three to six months worth of maintained learning, and we actually come up with a different approach based on what's there. So it really does come down to that one shoe does not fit all. Most of it does, but not necessarily. Um, with each of these methodologies you apply, you've got to actually work out what is the market doing, what's the cash flow, what's the risk associated with that, with what's there, and it may be you try to apply a couple of Maybe we try to buy a capitalisation earnings and compare that to a discounted cash flow. Now, discounted cash flow inherently is inaccurate because you're trying to work out what each of your future cash flows, year's cash flow is going to be. We have got a crystal ball. And um, what's the risk associated with all those future cash flows? Should be a different risk rate that's applied. In five years' time, what's the terminal value? What are things going to be worth in five years' time? There's so many question marks with that that it's very difficult to apply. However, in saying that, as a um, second methodology, as a test check of what you've done, it should come out fairly similar. So you apply it to see if it does. And if it doesn't, you start asking questions. So you start to start looking at what is the most appropriate thing there and what are the limitations for each of the approaches you apply. Um, looking at the actual specific risks that are coming in, um, looking at the cash flows there, how secure those cash flows, how likely they have changed. Well, the most things that methodology adopt um, the risk, you know, you probably see the capitalisation of future maintainable earnings. That really assumes the earnings are going to continue for perpetuity in theory, but in reality, it might 
10 years. But if you, if you, from what you know of the business, you know it's got, maybe it will die in four years' time and the lease expires or whatever. That's where you guys can at least say, well, have they used the right methodology or not? Knowing what I know about the business. So not applying the methodology correctly, so that's the capitalization of maintainable earnings, CFME. Future maintainable earnings, capitalization rate, net tangible assets. Have they done all those right? So that's, um, hopefully, you know, people who came to our valuation session, if you paid attention, you know whether that's all been done right. Uh, what you probably do is get a shout out and <laughs> tell you whether it's been done properly. Um, get a second opinion. Um, DCF is discounted cash flow, so you know, look at in terms of the job that no one's got a crystal ball, so but are the cash flows reasonable? The discount rate, the growth they're assuming, they're taking tax into account if it's applicable. Um, sometimes we look at a dividend stream, so if you've only got 10% of a company, maybe all you'll ever get is some dividends, you can never sell your shares. So is that the appropriate? And that's probably you know, one of the questions in number six too, is if you have only got someone who's got 10%, should it just be 10% of the whole, or should you just be looking at what the dividend is they're going to get out of it? Uh, and determining goodwill, I still see occasionally evaluation. I don't know if you all remember, but you know, earnings divided by capitalization rate equals business value. I still see the odd value up to that equals goodwill. Earnings divided by capitalization rate less the tangible assets equals goodwill. They missed that last step. We'll put to that once a year. And have they valued the business or have they valued the entity? And then um, another whole question of minority discount, where you've got a very small portion um, textbook valuation say that you should discount that for the fact that you're not 10% of the whole is not equal to the whole divided by 10 because you haven't got any control. Who's seen that? That's not an interesting really clearing up. I'm not looking at it. It's, mm -hmm. it's really coming into a fun. Um, and we, we did one. We've had a few where we've issued the report and one side's come back and said, we notice you haven't taken into account the minority dis discount. Yeah, obviously, in their client's interest, have the discount applied. And it's something we probably haven't thought about, but well, I haven't specifically mentioned it in the report. I won last week. We had, uh, Two reports out to the same solicitor. One was a 50 50, and I said he doesn't have control, yet, based on the situation, no discount. The other one, he had 25%, and I applied a probably less than what I would normally apply based on what was there. And he looked at these two and just said, What are you doing? So he's come back and one of them said, Why have you not applied an international type of for? Why have you not applied a discount for not an interest in the thing? How often do you do it the same solicitor in the same week? Um, and I'm fairly excited for one, and, and I have to just start doing a full explanation of, of what's there. And it, 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 it's, it's real, it's out there, and, and it's getting applied a lot, but it can range. Um, there was one solicitor, an accountant who doesn't work with a lot of the industry quite prominent. He would apply, if you had a 33% interest in the business, he would discount, depending on which side he worked for, um, he would discount. Um, 30% for, for lack of control and 35% for lack of marketability. Uh, so he would discount by 65%. And he would stand in court well on Mike's accent work out it is. Um, in my experience, that's that's appropriate. Um, and if it's working the other side, no, 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 it doesn't, doesn't apply. Um, and the case law goes anything up to 65%. But every every case turns on its thing. So you might only own 25%, but if you're the driver and you've got day-to-day -day control and you know, all the cars are bigger, well, there well, may not be a discount. But if you have only got 25% and you don't even work in the business, you're just an investor, who would buy your shares, all those sort of issues come into it, so why there might be a discount. Because you just walk back in, Andrew. Have you seen it in practice? Um, discount minority interest. So you've got a, sorry, discount for minority interest ownership? Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Are you seeing you it? You can't drag them out. For not being able to drag them down. No, for um, you've got a business that you own a 33% interest in, um, so the value comes through and actually discounts that because you don't own 100%. Right. Do you, you see it very often? No. Right. Anyone else on the commercial side? Other than the what's, what's the philosophy behind this? It, it, it sits there um, 
if you if you've got a minority interest, you don't control the data decisions, um, therefore there's additional risk. And it's harder to sell 33% it may not be, but harder to sell 33 percent than it is to actually control the sale of the whole business. Um, therefore, it may take longer to sell your interest, therefore there's greater risk of the actual price will fluctuate in that time. Um, and the reality is exactly that. Although in theory, it's very relevant and very appropriate in practice, it rarely gets it actually done in practice for a sale. So again, bit of a segue, but I think it's related. Um, in those sorts of situations where there's the potential that you have uh, third parties that own an entity through a shareholding, um, is it a good idea to have a valuation methodology agreed up front for the purposes of transferring your interest to a third party or internally if you want to get out, or should you just wait until the day? It's, my view is personally, yeah. it is not appropriate to, for the reason that the Although the methodology is known today because of the facts, the facts change and that methodology may be appropriate. However, for comfort reasons, it's often done and I don't disagree with that. Let's go back to six. Yeah, that's one of the questions we always ask. Is there a shareholders agreement that does specify something? So it might dictate the methodology you have to use. If you don't use something else, well, then your valuations are right. So on the home strips. So uh, book value is, you know, on the balance sheet, you see plant equipment, less depreciated value. If there hasn't been a chattel value or go in there, the value is only assumed that's the, that's the market value. But things like fit outs, you know, I mean, it might be the first year of your lease, you pay $500,000 to fit out your restaurant. But if you were to um, close the doors, you'd probably get two pounds a bucket all for that. Um, so it relates to the tangible assets. Um, at the end of the day, though, we've got no alternative but to come up with some value we've got to attribute to it. So that is the best of, of nothing, I suppose. Um, so just be aware that you know, when you've got a high sunk cost, that's what it is. It's a sunk cost. It's not necessarily a realisable value. And also where you've got debtors in stock, if that going concern issue comes into it, are you going to collect all your debtors? Are you going to be able to sell your stock for at least um, what you pay for it? We're coming up with this one a lot. Um, we're doing um, valuation of some supermarkets. We have so many examples of this now. We're doing some valuation of supermarkets where they've done these renovations in the last couple of years, hoping the business will turn around and they're selling for years and years and leases. And, and, the, and the business hasn't turned around. So they've just gone and invested, bought the business, invested $2 million, and now the business is a break even, maybe a little bit more. And the landlord's given a big incentive, so he's not going to let them just break the lease. So they've maybe spent $2 million on the fit out and the landlord kicks in a mill or something, I think, on one um, so from that point of view, if you value it based on the cash flow, which is all you're going to get back from this place, um, you're not going to be able to sell the equipment it's gone. Um, so from the valuation viewpoint, cash flow viewpoint, it might be valued at 200 grand. So you spent $3 million with the incentive setting it up. How much is it worth? So my view is 300 grand. The, the actual fit out's gone. So adopting book value, you know, we discussed in our last session that the value is the higher of capitalised value or the actual assets employed. The problem is the assets employed may not be book value, they may be you know, gone, some cost. Um, what if the business is actually making the same situation, you've got $3 million running 15 years, um, but the businesses were in council. Um, the business has reduced turnover by 45% and now is making a $300,000 loss a year. Call it $200,000 loss, but less than what the actual, sorry, more than what the, um, less, than, sorry, less than what the actual rent is for rent. So you actually, if you keep it trading, you won't be down until at least the sun ends of the rent. So it's making $200,000 a year. You spent $3 million. How much would you pay for it? So the opportunity to make $200,000 loss in the next 15 years. <coughs> and that's happening all the time as well. So there, there's, we sort of think that a business value can go down to zero. But if you put all these actual liabilities or contingent liabilities, it may be less than zero. I mean, what we're doing in these ones is actually valuing it on a discounted cash flow basis. We're actually capitalising that loss and saying it's worth negative value in the ground. You can't get out of it. You've got the commitment. You can either go to the landlord today and say, I'll give you a lump sum or whatever. And it's not just the tangibles. I did actually that same pharmacy. He also owned a pharmacy that he bought 18 months earlier in a shopping centre for $3 million, so paid $3 million with goodwill. Then decided to convert it to a price line for some stupid reason. So what happens when you convert to a price line? Day one, your script numbers drop by about 20% because everyone perceives it as a cosmetic store, not a pharmacy. When 
and I valued at 18 months after he bought it, after it had been a price line for 14 months, it's only worth $2 million. It's still making money, it's still profitable or whatever. So try explaining that to the, to the wife. Yeah, he's made this really bad decision. He borrowed $3 million a year and a half ago to buy a business that's now only worth $2 million. That was an interesting conversation. Um, so accepting the information provided at face value. So what are real, what's the value relied on? At the end of the day, you know, you take things with a grain of salt, but you don't necessarily always assume everyone's lying to you. But you know people have their agenda. The business owning spouse is going to be talking it down. The non-business owning spouse is going to be talking it up. It'll be somewhere in the middle is the true story. And what you've really got to do is say, right, what are they telling me? And what are all these other things I can look at? What's the industry doing? You know, what's the historical performance? What are the customers? And putting it all together and saying, yeah, you're selling me porkies, or yeah, that makes sense in terms of all um, so It's really just putting it all in the mix and sort of trying to, to uh, work out what the true story is. Who's prepared the financial statements? Yeah, how reliable are they? Um, is there a vested interest, of course? And you know, from what you know of the business, does the value appear to have considerable the main things? Then at the end of the day, there's a sniff test. So if the number you come up with doesn't just step out of the same clause, but would someone pay that much for that business? So is it reasonable? Um, would someone in the market actually pay that amount? Maybe someone in the market, like the software guy, might pay an awful lot more than what you think it's worth. And even that supermarket that John was talking about, he bought that, what, a year ago. It was losing money. He paid 400000 for a plus stock. So in the scheme of things, a relatively small amount. But given he then spent $3 million on a fit-out, but he'd still be prepared to pay something for a loss-making business that if we valued it 18 months ago, we would have said it was worth zero or less than zero. So people out there in the market, it's that price versus value thing. Again, people do pay money or they see an opportunity that maybe we don't see. He knows he operates another six supermarkets. He reckons he knows how to run a good supermarket. He reckons he can turn it around. Today, he hasn't been able to. Um, Probably from your point of view, the test is if the goodwill is any more than about three years worth of profit, it's probably, you know, is it reasonable? People rarely pay any more than about three years. Um, and then if you've got this massive value, would a buyer just go and start up their own business? So if you end up with too big a value, um, people might just go and start their own rather than buy your business. So you may never be able to achieve what the theoretical value is in the market. And at the end of the day, yeah, are there any market transactions? So that's the, the big problem we have with being a property value is we don't have RP data to tell us all the properties, all the businesses that have sold. And the limited data you do have um, is really not worth anything. So uh, unless it's a, a business that we've seen before and in the probably preceding 12 months that we know was an actual transaction, very hard to say, I've seen this business sell in the marketplace. Uh, Red Rolls is one. You, there is a bit of a database out there. You can search them as to what they're selling for. Financial planning terms a little bit too. And then we do a fair few bank value, um, financing valuations too. So we do see, we do actually see some real transactions. We know what people are paying for businesses. And it still comes back to a lot of the time, the payback period is the thing that at the end of the day, people really pay more than three times to the real, three times profit. Um, and then just are there all uh, any of those other specific issues that, that maybe the value might in theory be right, but if you know that in two years' time they have to spend a major amount on a capital expenditure because the only reason they'll be making profits is because they haven't been renewing their equipment. Um, we did have that radiology clinic recently. So, what is an MRI? It's 1.2 million. It depends, anyway. <laughs> 2 million for an MRI machine. And they've got a 10 year life basically. So hers was what, two or three years old? So she's trying to sell. So she's, she's saying, this thing's got seven years left in it. All you've got to do is just get it serviced regularly, and that's built into my cash flows. There's no major capital expenditure for seven years. This thing will just be a money making machine for seven years. But in seven years' time, yeah, you've got to spend another two million. 